much for attending our panel today. So our discussion today is about product leadership. And so we'll be covering topics from uh, setting strategy and shaping culture and uh, building teams. So my name is Mary Smith, as um, Ellie introduced me already. And um, I will be moderating this panel with um, three amazing women in product. So let's start with the brief introductions. Uh, Amruda, Ellen, and Laura, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, how you started in product, and you know, a few words about your trajectory, and how, how did you get to where you are today? Hi, I want to start. Um, hello, everyone. It's all amazing to be here. Uh, I'm Amruta. I'm first a mom. I have uh, two young girls. And most of the time, of course, I'm spending with them, guiding them. And I do the same thing uh, in my work life. I design, I guide my team, uh, I help them through the tough times. Uh, that's me. Um, how I started in product, uh, I don't have a great story. It was kind of by accident, actually. Um, I graduated when uh, the time was not right, around 2000, 2003. No jobs. I had a bunch of jobs. I was an international student. Uh, I had jobs that were retracted because nobody wanted to, you know, sponsor my visa. And at that point, I was at a stage where I went into an interview and uh, they made you file, fill a form. Do you want to be an engineer? Do you want to be a product person? What do you want to be? And I did not fill it. I just went to him. I said, I don't think I'm going to get the job. Why don't you fill it out after you interview me and tell me what job I'll be best at? And he filled out the product section. And that's how I landed up in a product role. <laughs> <laughs> so it was completely by accident. Uh, and then I never looked back. Uh, I jumped roles. I was lucky enough to be able to work on uh, V1 products through my career. I worked on very interesting things with data, ML, AI, and uh, just the drive for doing the best got me where I am. This is great. It's a little bit of a different story. I'm Ellen Chiza, and like many of you, I did my undergrad in engineering. And I'm happy the story finally comes full circle now. But when I graduated, every time I spent time writing code, I felt like I wasn't making good use of my time because I was one of those people who'd miss a semicolon and six hours later, I would be very angry about my missing six hours. So I wanted to do something a little bit higher leverage and went into product, went to Microsoft first. After a couple of years there, I wanted to have broader scope. So I went to Kickstarter, smaller company, got to do all of the backer experience. After that, I was excited to do the same thing again and really felt the way to increase scope was to help train others to do the same thing. Became VP of product at a travel company called Lola. And then after that, I really felt like I wasn't enabling enough people just by managing product managers. I wanted to make the entire software development process better. And so that's what Dark, my company, does now. We're working on building a much better holistic development environment. Cool. Laura? You all heard Joanna of Laura this morning. So I'm supposed to present myself the way Joanna would want. And so I start with, how many of you remember your teenage years? What was that like? <laughs> Challenging? Exciting? Startups that are facing fast growth go through a similar stage. They need to change in order to succeed, but it can be difficult. And what I do is I help fast-growing companies navigate these challenging teenage years by building the product teams, the product strategies, and the processes they need to be successful. I've been in product for almost 20 years. I was a civil engineer, moved into doing a lot of uh, software development for civil engineering, moved into the software industry, wanted to be in product, didn't know what it meant, and I started. And I've been in many industries from speech recognition to legal technology. Now I'm a uh, senior vice president of product at Lever that does software that modernizes the way organizations uh, recruit and bring in great talent. By the way, my CEO is a woman, and we have over 50% women in the product and engineering organization. <laughs> and I also am, I guess, lecturer at Stanford, where I teach product management, and I'm a board member of Leading Women in Technology, a nonprofit dedicated to helping women develop the leadership skills they need to move in their careers. And in many ways, I think I've just been very lucky through my career. I tried different things. I was uh, doing a lot of what was mentioned earlier today. When I felt stuck, when I felt I wasn't learning anymore, I knew it was time for me to move to the next thing. 
When I felt that there was something different I wanted to do, I decided I wanted to be part of the executive leadership team in a company to get more exposure. I thought I left a great job I had to do that and take the risk. And it's been, it's been rewarding to do that. It's just so inspiring to listen to you. Very, very different paths. So let's, um, let's start with the topic of building teams. And so can you share a little bit of your experience in this area? Any, any success stories or failures? Um, what, what are the traps to look for? Or you know, things that are really, really important to strive and get right when building teams? I, I can go first. Um, I think uh, when you're building a team, you probably, of course, know kind of what you want. I think from the traps perspective, this is pretty common, everyone's probably heard this, don't try to hire more of the same. It's very easy to do that, you're like, oh my god, I have this person on my team, uh, he or she is technical, this, that, that's exactly the kind of person I want. And that's usually the trap we fall in. Um, diversity is something you want to think about, and uh, go beyond the traditional diversity definition. Think of diversity in thoughts, and think of diversity of what people bring to the table. And uh, hire people when you see the right people, too. I'll give you an example from my career. There is one person on my team, and uh, she was in marketing. And uh, I used to work with her very well, but I kind of saw this thing in her. She had been a product person in a startup long time back, and I was like, I want her on my team. She did not have a technical background. She still doesn't. She comes completely from marketing and language background, but I just hired her in, and I created a space for her because I wanted that different point of view, and I saw that she would be an asset to my team. So I would say kind of do that and make sure when you're building a team, the most important thing for me is making sure you create a creative space. A creative space is extremely important. Every product idea is not the product leader's idea and it comes from a team. And anyone you hire needs to add and amplify that creative space. And that's what I would say you want to think about. Great. I totally agree with that. And to build on it, I think another piece you can do as a product leader is we've talked a lot about psychological safety recently. And as a leader, you have the capital within the organization to help create that space for your team so they can go out on a limb and use those yeah. unique advantages they have and be able to bring that to the organization. I would add, and I completely agree with both of those, uh, I would add in terms of the potential mistakes, there are two things you need to watch out for. You want to bring a team together, you want to help them develop and coach them. But if there is someone in your team who's not working out, even after you've tried, you have to let them go. Because if it lingers, it will take down the entire yeah. team. And it's a hard decision to make, but you have to be able to do it. The second one is, Dedicate time to hiring. It's hard, it's painful. For me, being in Lever has been like night and day because the product is actually great to <laughs> help with hiring, and I didn't build it, so I just joined recently. But it's a lot of work, mm -hmm. but you have to dedicate the time. And also trust a little bit your instinct. My probably biggest mistake hiring is I hired a woman who was incredibly smart. She had been in the company for a while, and I had a bad feeling because she was very arrogant. And it was a big mistake. And in product, especially, you cannot have arrogant people. Yeah. You have to have humility to learn. So watch out for that one. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, to build on that, I think in my own experience, you know, having a, um, the right PM is half of the battle. And having, hiring the wrong person can just completely destroy the team. And so, Helen, maybe you can share with us, how do you think about uh, when you hire people, what do you look for, and um, how do you think about you know, hiring uh, from outside versus sort of investing um, in growing people from within? Yeah, I think what Laura's saying about humility is absolutely correct, and I think another piece of that is curiosity. And I think whenever a PM is curious, they're going to be interested in talking to the other people on the team, they're going to be interested in doing the research to find things out, um, and so I think if someone has those two traits and they also have an ability to think empathetically and work with people and think about their users and they have the ability to think systematically and be able to present things in a logical fashion that everyone else can get, they're going to work out really well. 
And I found that oftentimes by working with someone, even from a different team within your organization, every single product person at Lola was a homegrown person who had never been in product before. Uh, when you're able to do that, you can actually assess those traits really accurately. Whereas with someone else, you might know like, yeah, they can manage a backlog, they've been in another company doing basic product things, but I'd rather have someone who has the right raw material than someone who knows the buzzwords. Do you, do you agree with that? Or? Whatever, if you want to continue. <laughs> I can definitely talk about all kinds okay. of things. But cool. <laughs> so maybe we'll, we'll let's, let's talk a little bit about uh, trouble, trouble teams. Um, so Amruta, you uh, went from senior PM to head of product, and you worked in many different environments, um, Microsoft and Topsy Labs, and now Salesforce. Um, how have you been able to diagnose uh, you know, a team that doesn't, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not doing well? Um, I think, I mean, I guess most of you can figure out the obvious traits around, you know, team that's not doing well is not going to be able to deliver well, they're going to miss their deadlines, the product that's uh, coming out of it is not going to kind of be what you expected. And um, those are kind of, I, I call them the most obvious things, right? You, you can just see them. Uh, the other things that are pretty obvious even before the product comes out, and mm -hmm. this is what you want to watch for, is when they're not talking the same language. Uh, when you talk to different people of the team and they talk about what they're working on in a different way, that's when you know they're not in sync. They're not talking to each other. They're not one single unit. And I think that is when you start kind of sensing it. And uh, I mean, we're all women. We have amazing intuition. Like we look at people and we know what they're thinking. Use that intuition. There's so <laughs> many times that I look at people and you know, you're in a room and there'll be one person who'll be like, and then you know there's something going on. So like, yeah. listen to your intuition. Usually like that's what I fall back to is when I'm talking to a team. It's very easy to sense what's going wrong. It's like my mother instinct too. When you look at a kid, you know what happened in school today? Something went wrong, did someone do something to you? It's the same intuition. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I'm a mom at work too, I guess. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think that's, that's what I would say. Uh, I can, I can relate to that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I think um, that, that's kind of helped me figure out kind of what's going on. Cool. Um, and a related question, you know, uh, especially for new managers, how do you think of and manage underperformers? And when do you know and how do you determine when it is time to let go? It's sort of related to the, to the question that we had before. Anyone? I'll take it. Oh. So I think that one key thing with new managers is you as a manager of a new manager have to help them a lot. Becoming a people manager is very different. Sometimes product managers have the feeling that they've managed teams because they do some level of managing an engineering team. People managing is very different, and it requires a lot of time and attention. And your first-time people managers in your team really need your help to be successful. And if they are in charge of someone who's not performing, that's probably kind of you're giving them the hardest thing. So what I try to do is start kind of really, on one hand, understanding where are the areas where this person is failing, talking to all of the stakeholders, and putting a plan for that person to prove that they can improve with some coaching. But you have to put a time box to that. You cannot decide that you're going to give this person three months, six months, 12 months to prove that they can get better. And you have to be very clear with them. It's like, we're going to work on these issues, and we will see how well you're doing. And if it doesn't work, you may have a conversation that doesn't have to be an awful one. It's that person might just not be in the right role for them. Mm -hmm. So the conversation when you have to let go of someone can be painful, but you can also make it more about why don't you start thinking what's the right role for you and have that conversation. I think that's very important. I mean, just to add to it, a lot of time people who are not good at their job are not aware that they're not good at their job. And I think it's having that honest conversation saying, hey, you're not a bad person, you're a good product person, but you're probably not fit for this, like you said, would be the first way to start. Because and a lot of times in my experience, I've just realized that people don't think they're doing a bad job. They just think they're good. And you just got to make them aware. I think another thing you can do is tell people what the weaknesses are and tell them what they would need to do to fix them. And sometimes people's weaknesses really correspond to their strengths, and they're going to make the choice that they don't want to fix that. 
And at that point, it becomes their decision that they want to move on and do something else. And it isn't that you've said you're bad. It's that you've said, I'm going to give you this option. I'll help you grow in this direction. Or you can decide that you would rather prioritize. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to them. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. OK, so Laura, a question for you. You've written about startups and uh, the different stages that they go through and how they have to you know, change to survive from one stage, from early stage when they're looking for product market fit to the next stage when they focus on growth. Um, when it comes to building teams, can you talk to us a little bit about your experience and what is different um, you know, in building teams in the different stages? Yeah, so your team has to map a little bit where the company is. In the very early stage, startups are very much in this iterative process. They are trying things very quickly, iterating, pivoting if necessary. And so from the product perspective, what you need is a lot of speed, a lot of new stuff that you can present to customers. When this uh, startup has product market fit and now they start to scale, you need something that's different. Now is the time where you need to start looking at what's your technical debt. How is the product now going to really scale? Because you can fail if you don't do those things. Um, in an early stage startup, you may have, especially in B2B, this uh, initial customer. So, so critical. And you're willing to do stuff for them that may not be ideal for the rest of the market, but you have to do that. When you get more mature and need to scale, you have to start managing those customers because they can completely take over your roadmap. So you need to start bringing skills in your team for people who can start dealing with those challenges that your early product team might not have been as familiar with. It's also very frequent that in the early stages, it's the co-founder, the CTO, who's playing the role of product lead. Mm -hmm. But when you start scaling, really you need to start looking at the whole picture of how is this product going to be successful. So I think you need a balance. Some of those people from the early stages that really had the vision, but bringing some people with experience and knowing what it means to scale, where you want to go. Yep, that makes sense. So now a few questions about strategy. So product managers often get this advice to be more strategic. Um, have you? Experience this yourself or given that advice to others, and what does it really mean to be more strategic? I actually sort of think this is advice we give to each other a lot as product managers because we all decided to do it because we're excited about creating the future and setting up the plan for where we're going and why. And I think a lot of us will say that we should be doing it more because we feel like we're not doing it that much. But the real question is, is that desperately what your organization needs you to be doing right now? It could be the organization needs strategic priority, but that could be coming from the rest of the executive team, from a founder, from a CEO. It could be that your team is struggling and you really need to be working with your team, or it could just be that you're like really in an execution phase. Yeah. And so I think it's all about what's necessary. Is that That's true. Yeah. I mean, it's every product person gets told that. I've been told that in the past. I'm like, you're not strategic. And strategy is about having a point of view and having a vision. That, that's all that it is. As a product person, you have a point of view, and you have to have a point of view, otherwise you do, do not you know, fit in this profession. So I think that's what it is. It's like when people say be strategic, it's like have a vision, have a true north, have a point of view, and just go there. But I would add, because I think this is especially important for women, and I have been told that oh, I wasn't strategic enough. Men are more willing to go out and paint these <laughs> pictures based on stuff that may or may not be true. One thing that I learned, <laughs> I, and, and I mean, th this was very much my experience in kind of one of my evolutions in my career. I was like running all of product, doing everything. And at one point, um, I heard my, the co-founder said, but she's not strategic enough. And I'm like, what does he mean? And then I realized is just be a little bit more vocal about some ideas that are further out there and just share them. Because if you don't, somebody else may be kind of saying, oh, I have all these great ideas. And then your head of product is a woman. It doesn't seem to be. Mm -hmm. So just be vocal. It's not that you're not strategic. You need to kind of make sure people know that you're thinking yeah. beyond the immediate Correct. execution. Hmm. Correct. You know, I, I recently came across this, um, this definition by Richard Rumold, and I, um, I'll read it to you. A good strategy is a set of actions that is credible, coherent, and focused on overcoming the biggest hurdles in achieving a particular objective. And so it sounds like just summarizing what you've said in this one, there's a, 
a couple of things that are always there, which is knowing your destination and knowing how to get there most effectively. Does this sort of jive with how you think about strategy? I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm not one for big words, so. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Simplicity is uh, my forte. But I think that's what it is. It's, you know, like Laura said, just be vocal. All of you guys have ideas. I mean, if you're working on a feature, a product, a whole strategy, you all have ideas. It's just having that clear vision of it and then it's execution towards it because ideas are also dime a dozen. It's all about how a product person takes that one idea and frames it, takes it forward in the right direction, keeping your customers and all these other things in mind that matter. Mm. So yep. that I, makes sense. I would just simplify it like that. And I think that you also have to be strategic within your role, right? Mm -hmm. If you are in charge of a piece of a product or a specific product, you need to be able to describe where you see the product going. Mm -hmm. If you are in a more executive level, you need to start looking at where is the company moving. And many times with startups, a startup will start around one product. Mm -hmm. But especially if you're VC funded, what's gonna happen is you're gonna start scaling but what your VCs will want to see is you're not going to be able to grow to the level they want based on one product. And then you have to start thinking, are we going to have a suite of products? Is this a platform? Are we going to extend? Yep. That's a next level of strategy. And that has to happen once you're head of product and so on. Mm -hmm. But within what you own, you can always be sort of strategic thinking, what's going to be the next thing? And you have to do that while executing on mm -hmm. the immediate piece. Mm -hmm. That's the key. Makes sense. Okay, I think um, what I'd like to do is take this one question from a fellow PM who recently asked this. Um, so I'll read it. I have experienced in many occasions that long-term strategic decisions um, have negative or neutral short-term impact. How do you go about convincing your team to work on long-term projects that don't have a clear short-term impact? So what would be your thoughts on this one? Advice. I, I mean, so the, I'm, I'm going to do this story. I, I've done it in my team. And as a product person, you're a quarterback. You have your goal in vision, right? And you, it's up to you how you shape that vision. And then it's your call how you take your team to that goal. Whether you're inching, you're going yard by yard, you're doing a Hail Mary, you're going However you're doing it, right? There'll be obstacles, there'll be a defensive lineup guy who's just gonna like topple the quarterback down at some point, you gotta <laughs> get up, you run, whatever it is, right? And uh, I think that's what it is. And I actually, I don't agree with the thing that uh, you have to do something that has a negative impact. If mm -hmm. you're doing anything that has a negative impact and you already know it's gonna have a negative impact, you're not supposed to do it, <laughs> right? To do it, like you know, the point in time is like, you do something, you learn from it, there are data points, and uh, you react mm -hmm. based on that. But you'll always go towards, you know, and you, if you don't have a long-term vision, think about it, pause. Think about it, do not go towards anything and take baby step towards something if you don't have that. It's okay to pause, that's what I'd say. Do you agree? Yeah, I think this question and the last one are actually very similar. I think at the end yeah. of the day, almost every job is actually sales. And as a PM, you're selling, this is what we're doing, and this is how we're doing it. And if you're having trouble getting the team on board with a longer term investment, it might not actually be about what the investment is. It might be about how you're framing that and how you're making it seem to the rest of the team. Cool. OK, I think, so let's close it with a couple of questions about culture. So some leaders attest that culture is the one most important thing to get right. And it can enable teams or it can actually hinder dramatically the outcomes of any team. Um, so is culture that important? And uh, in your perspective, uh, what is culture really um, in context of a company or a team? I can go first. I'd say culture is critical, especially if you're starting um, with a company that's going to grow fast. And what I've seen is many times the founders of a startup have an idea of what the culture should be, and that culture gets sort of um, learned organically in a small team. The challenge becomes when the company starts growing really fast, and all of a sudden you have offices that are remote. This assumption that the distribution of the culture that was happening organically is going to continue is mm -hmm. not true, and I've seen that happen. And so 
what the company has to do, and that's true across the entire company, it's true, it's true across your team, there has to be a proactive effort to continue to reinforce what are the values, to continue to reinforce how the car culture gets reflected in your day-to-day -day mm -hmm. job. And that means it has to be embedded in the processes mm -hmm. of the company, in the hiring processes, in the training processes. Um, I really like a quote from Patty, um, uh, the, who was the chief talent officer at Netflix during their really high growth years. And she said that process may slow you down, but discipline doesn't. And discipline from the perspective of culture is embedding how, how we work how we work with each other, what we believe in. And if you embed that in what your team is doing day in, day out, it will propagate. I think it's one of the most important You lost your mic. Oh. Mike? Mike? OK. Oh, oh. Um, it's, it's really about if you're willing to hold the line on it. And I think where the reason it breaks down when you start growing quickly is it's we need someone in this chair doing this work right now. And you start to say, well, was this value we originally hired for really that important? Or you say, well, we're people who these We already have 50 people who encompass these values. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you better keep your face I feel like one direction. The mic. <laughs> yes. Try it again. <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, will it matter if person 51 actually embodies this or not? And the answer is always yes. And is the one thing that can never be compromised on. Yeah, I, I think yeah. culture is, uh, it's like you have family rules, right? You have an aura around your family. You're happy when you're in that environment. You, are, you perform the best when you're in that environment. That's what you want. As a leader, you're setting the tone for your team. And that's what I think of as culture. It's like setting the tone. How would you all work together? What's your rhythm? How do you, and every team culture is different. And that might work for them. One culture may not work for you. And you have to find the culture that works best. And always remember, as you grow, it's going to trickle down. So make sure you're driving the right culture across your team. Because it's like, you know, your team is going to grow. They will take that culture somewhere else with them. So it's, you know, you just, it's very important, I think. Cool. So I think we're running out of time, but um, I wanted to ask this one question of you, Ellen. You have an interesting experience and you worked in startups and now you are uh, leading one. So how do you think about the relationship between the product leaders and the CEO founders and, and how it affects culture? Um, could you share your experience with us? Yeah, I've been thinking about this a lot recently. So I think a thing that makes early stage startups succeed, one of the founders has a unique idea that someone else can't see in the market. And it's just something that no one else has to take the chance to execute on. <laughs> uh, and so when you bring in a product person, they're bringing in a lot more rigor. And it can be extremely hard for a founder to make the change from, I'm operating based on instincts. I don't quite know why this is working, but I know doing what I know is working. And then teach them that, OK, that works to get from one, like zero to one. To get from one to n, there are a whole bunch of actual rules we have to follow. And I think that transition moment is really key. And I think that's where a lot of product founder relationships break down. Yeah, cool. Well, thank you so much for every, all the knowledge and insights. Um, Give a round of applause, yeah? <laughs>